take it away, Cecilia. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to session five of the uh, Chandra Data Science Workshop. Um, I'm Cecilia Garrafo. I am um, an astrophysicist uh, working for Chandra at CFA, and I'm going to chair this session where we have six wonderful speakers. Um, okay, so first we have Brad. I'm part of the of the SOC, I should mention, I guess. And first we're gonna start with Brad Snyos that is going to talk about detection of extended X-ray emission from low count sources. And I will leave the room for Brad. All right, let me just start my slides. Everyone see that okay? Okay. Yes. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you for the introduction and thank you all for being here. So I am going to talk today about some uh, recent methods to detect uh, extended X-ray emission from uh, low count sources. Uh, this work's been led by myself in collaboration with my uh, supervisors, Dan Schwartz and Anyeta Anyeta Aneta Chemnyaska. Oof. Uh, apologies if you hear any uh, rumbling or thunder in the background, as there's quite a storm going on outside here. So, uh, well, sorry for the interruption, you. Brad. I should ask you, everyone, to please type your questions at the on the Q and A or the chat or the Slack, please, because I'm going to read them from there uh, instead of raising hands or anything. Perfect. Okay. okay. All right. Well, then I'll get started just by uh, quickly talking about what is extended x-ray emission. And uh, simply put, extended x-ray emission is uh, any source where we can resolve the morphology of the x-ray emitting region. Uh, and this is something that's been increasingly more common with x-ray, modern x-ray telescopes, I should say. Of the available x-ray instruments that are currently in flight, Chandra is sort of the gold standard of these types of studies. Uh, due to its sub arc second resolution, which allows us to resolve X-ray structure from a wide variety of sources. Um, in studying extended X-rays, we can gain a lot of valuable insight into the physical processes that occur within these systems, uh, into things such as the evolution of that object, as well as the interaction of that object and its local environment. And we find these types of extended X-ray sources in a variety of situations from the nearby, like Jupiter and Earth, as I'm showcasing here, as well as the not so nearby, like M87 and Centaurus A. Um, all of these sources are driven by very different X-ray emitting mechanisms, but the uh, commonality between them is that they are all resolvable at Chandra's resolution. Now, those familiar with uh, X-ray morphology studies you'll know that you generally use a long exposure in order to get any type of definitive detection. And that's due to the typically low signal to noise you get from the uh, extended emitting region. Uh, these types of studies obviously come with some uh, notable drawbacks. In particular, it, it consumes a significant amount of telescope time in order to get any type of science returns. Uh, as a result, it's generally impractical to observe all sources at this type of deep exposure. I, there's only so many hours in the day, and I can't simply use all of the telescope time to point at one single source when there are a lot of other sources out there that need to be studied. Um, and then lastly, there's really no guarantee of, of those scientific deliverables. Just because you point your telescope at an object for a factor of 10 longer exposure or a factor of 100 longer exposure doesn't mean you're going to get a scientific, a greater science result. Uh, on the right, I'm showcasing one example where you do get that. That's uh, looking at the iron K line emission from Cygnus A in a 20 kilosecond exposure compared to a two megasecond exposure. So a factor of a hundred greater. And you go from having just maybe a bright point source with some, some indication of extended emission around it to very clearly seeing the sort of cocoon-like structure that you can now study and provide a, a lot of um, very valuable scientific discoveries from. But not every source is going to be like this. And so it's important to understand and sort of classify which sources we get extended x-rays from and sort of 
ranking them, giving us an idea of which sources should we follow up on right now, what sources maybe we could wait a little later on. Now, there are a lot of different methods for sort of testing for extended x-rays from different sources. You'll hear about a couple uh, later this afternoon, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but for our group, we focus on testing for extended x-rays through the use of simulated observations. Uh, we generate those simulated observations using uh, models of the Chandra PSF, which provide high accurate recreations of point source images. So this is, a, again, assuming a point source with no extension at all. We can then compare that to an observation and find discrepancies between that observation and the simulation. And those discrepancies hopefully point to areas of a high probability of extended x-ray emission from the host source itself. Um, this, this technique is unique in that it allows us to detect the probability of extended x-rays with relatively low count statistics due to the overall high accuracy of Chandra's PSF. And I'll talk more about sort of the, the method and some of the PSF results in a couple slides from now. But before that, I want to just briefly mention the sources that we also analyze with this type of method. And for our group, we've been focusing mostly on studying high redshift quasars. Now, high redshift quasars are sort of an ideal candidate for this type of study as they are extended objects, and they are generally at a resolution that should be resolvable with Chandra, somewhere between one to 10 arc seconds in length, usually. Um, additionally, the central core from these quasars, uh, for reference, a quasar is usually some bright AGN with some jetted outflows from it. That bright AGN is usually easily detectable in x-rays, but it's that extended jet emission that is usually somewhat trickier to uh, resolve due to the low counts from it. Um, <clears throat> for our analysis, we prioritize sources where we knew that there was extended radio emission from them at scales that should be resolvable with Chandra, as the presence of extended radio emission usually indicates extended X-ray emission. Not always, which is also why we need to perform these types of studies. And then lastly, we use snapshot observations for the survey. So 10 kiloseconds per target. For those of you that speak observer, you'll likely know that that's a very short exposure. By Chandra standards, a typical exposure is anywhere from 20 to 40 kiloseconds for a typical observation. So looking at something for only 10 kiloseconds is quite low, and you're going to be fighting a lot of noise and background of just sort of the systematic, really, than anything else. So here I'm showcasing the 14 sources we looked at in this particular survey. And uh, reassuringly, we find uh, detections of that central AGN core from all 14 sources, which is great. And I'm showcasing all of the uh, postage stamp images, if you will, of the X-ray emission here, overlaid with radio contours in green. We see pretty good agreement between the X-ray and radio cores. But when it gets to looking at those extended emission regions, it's a little more nebulous. I, I would say by eye, I don't think there's many sources in here. I could definitively say I'm seeing extended x-ray emission from. And even the ones where I think I could trick myself into believing that there might be emission, it's tough to say whether or not that's due to truly a physical source or if that's just um, passant noise, or are we looking at some sort of asymmetry within Chandra's PSF? These are the types of things we want to explore more through a more rigorous analysis and sort of comparing it to a simulated observation. So let's talk about generating those simulated observations. Um, we begin by generating 500 simulated ray tracing files of each observation using Chart, which is a web interface um, of the SAO SAC tool. This is a CXE maintained utility specifically designed for developing these ray tracing files for Chandra's PSF at high accuracy. So it's a perfect tool for this type of analysis and there's no need to reinvent the wheel when there's already something out there that will do exactly what we want. Um, for our analysis, we had to generate these simulations uh, for each observation. We could not generate a sample set that would encompass all of them. And that's due to the, due to the asymmetries present within Chandra's PSF. 
Uh, Chandra is known to have an asymmetric PSF that is dependent on things such as the off-axis angle, the roll angle of the instrument, and even the energy response. So depending on the spectral profile of your source, you're going to get a slightly different PSF with respect to a different source. Um, as a result, this is not a one-size-fits-all solution. You have to go through the process of running these simulations for each unique source in your catalog. That said, it's actually a very straightforward process, again, owing to the fact that these utilities have been so well um, developed over the years and are pretty robust in that regard. <clears throat> Once we get these ray tracing files for each observation, we then project them, uh, essentially making synthetic PSF images for each observation. And this was also done using another CXE maintained utility marks. Again, this one is specifically designed for this task of generating synthetic PSF images using various types of ray tracing uh, input files. So it's again, a perfect utility and just to reiterate, no need to reinvent the wheel. There's already a great source out there to do these things for you. Now when generating these types of uh, synthetic images, you're going to be uh, running into issues with the encircled counts fraction, sort of telling you how much, how much blur you essentially want to apply to your final synthetic image. Uh, for reference, these files or these synthetic images are essentially developed at an infinite resolution and then blurred to match your observational image. And depending on what blur parameter you select is going to dictate how good of an agreement you get to the final source. Now for most observations, if you're looking at extended X-ray emission at large distances, uh, two arc seconds, three arc seconds or greater, it doesn't really matter what your blur parameter is as long as you're, you, know, you can use the default ones and you'll be fine. Uh, however, in our situation, we're looking at sources where there might be extended emission on about one arc second scales. And that's at a distance where this blur parameter becomes quite important. And you can see that in the figure on the right, where I have the encircled count fraction plotted against the radius from the core. Uh, the dotted black line is from an actual observation of one of the sources in our catalog. And all the colored lines are simulations of that observation with different blurred parameters applied. You can see that again, once you get past about three ACES pixels or a distance of about 1.5 arc seconds, there are, all these models are essentially similar to one another and agree quite nicely with the data. But when you're looking at distances about one arc second or two ACES pixels, that uh, blurring parameter has a pretty significant impact on the ECF. And uh, we tried several different parameters in this analysis and found that application of about a 0.28 arc second blur to the simulations is required to match the observations. But reassuringly, it actually matched the, all of our observations quite well just using this modification to the parameter. And so should you want to try something similar at home, I recommend starting with this type of uh, blurring and then sort of tweaking it from there, comparing it to your observations in question. So having generated the simulated PSFs, now they, with all of the uh, blurring uh, correctly accounted for, spectral response, all the asymmetries within the PSF, everything's been taken care of in that regard. We now want to assess those original observations for evidence of any extended X-ray features. To do so, we define annular sectors for each quasar. And we define the inner and outer radii of those sectors based on the known uh, emission regions of the extended radio features. We then extract the total counts per sector for the observed observation, as well as the 500 simulated images. In addition to that, we also measure the background counts from our um, image, from our actual observation image, using an off axis pointing as the PSF simulations do not account for any uh, cosmic background that we would expect in these types of observations. Uh, doing so would look something like this, where we define one of those sectors, now highlighted in orange, and then we extract the values from it by just simply counting the parameters. And we get a couple different uh, byproducts from that. Firstly, we get the total number of observed counts, C obs in this case, and then we get a distribution 
of the measured counts over the 500 simulated observations. In all situations, these are in low count statistics. So unsurprisingly, it comes out to being a Poisson distribution. So I will just call this a P sim. And then we also, as I mentioned, measure the background statistics. And again, unsurprisingly, it's low counts. We're going to get another Poisson distribution, and sure enough, we do. And that's another Poisson distribution P background or PBKG. So now we want to sort of compare the measured value, C obs, to these distributions to sort of figure out the probability of detection. Is this C obs in excess to what we predict from these? distributions, and if so, by how much. Um, but obviously, we have two distributions there. Uh, fortunately, because they are both Poisson, we can use a, a little bit of mathematics to combine the two, as we know that the uh, sum of any two independent Poisson variables will be a, a Poisson variable. So in essence, we can take PSIM and PBKG, and now we can make a combined distribution with the two of those together. If we can then compare that uh, measured value C obs to our newly derived distribution, and we can see if there is any excess as well as sort of quantify that excess using a sigma threshold. Uh, here I'm showcasing the results of the 12 sectors from one of our sources. Uh, each sector, you can see the uh, predicted distribution with the blue histogram, and then you also see an orange dotted line, and that is the measured counts in that section or in that sector. So that is C obs in each of those sectors. Uh, for the most part, we see that C obs sort of fluctuates around one sigma of the median of you would expect for that um, distribution, some a little higher, some a little lower. Uh, which is good. That means we're sort of getting reassuring fits there. Uh, but if we look at the top row for sector three, we find uh, 14 counts from that sector, and uh, that is our C obs value. And if we compare that to the, the distribution, we see it is clearly in excess of what we would predict from our models. And actually calculating that, we find that is a greater than three sigma detection at that particular sector. So neat, <laughs> we found evidence of extended x-rays from that particular sector in this source. We have two minutes, Brad. Perfect. Uh, so um, using this analysis, we uh, repeated this for all 14 sources in the catalog. And in short, we found five quasars that had extended x-ray emission at a greater than 99.95% probability. Um, on the left, I'm showing those five sources. And the blue uh, region there is the sector in which extended x-rays were detected. Uh, for all of these regions, the number of counts in there range between about 7 to 12 uh, extended x-ray counts. So we are very much looking at very low count statistics in this, this analysis. But nonetheless, we're getting pretty high um, confidence intervals, which is um, very, very encouraging that this type of analysis is working, even with this type of snapshot observation uh, metric. Um, reassuringly, we also see that the extended x-rays in four of the five sources are coincident with the radio features, and that is something we sort of expect for quasars. We should see the x-rays and radio features to sort of co-align with one another. So this is sort of reaffirming that we are likely looking at a physical source of emission. Um, I won't go through all the details on the results here, but suffice to say, using these results, we can get things like flux measurements from the extended emission by making some assumptions on the spectral profiles of them and compare them to other quasar systems where we can sort of assess things like uh, redshift dependence on these types of objects. Now, I know many of you will look at this analysis and say, this is interesting, but you had 14 sources, 12 sectors per source, and you're doing a statistical ensemble of them. Um, statistically speaking, some of those are going to be false positive. So what's the sort of confidence interval you have? How confident are you that you're not getting false positives on any of these or some of these? And that's a great uh, question. I bet I preempted some of them already. Um, and uh, to verify this, we performed follow-up observations for three of the five sources already. And in all three of them, we have confirmed the presence of extended x-rays in the sectors we found from our initial analysis. Uh, the remaining two sources were actually just 
approved for Chandra observations in the upcoming cycle as well. So there will be more information on this going forward. And uh, with that, I'm already running a little low on time. So I will simply put my summary up and uh, take any questions you may have. So with that, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Brad. Uh, yes, there's uh, some questions. So Solon Balman is asking, what exactly do you mean by writing Chandra PSF is asymmetric on one arc second scale? So the PSF itself is asymmetric? Response is asymmetric? Yes, so the, the PSF of Chandra is uh, inherently asymmetric, particularly at small scales. Um, this is true for even on-axis targets, um, though if you go off-axis, even at very large scales, you'll find uh, notable asymmetry present within them. Okay, uh, the next question is, what is the physical cost of the blur? This is Keith Arn Arnott asking, what is the physical cost of the blur and why isn't it included in the ray tracing? Sure, so the ray tracing is um, assuming essentially a perfect resolution. And then once you feed it through marks, it will uh, blur that out to whatever resolution you define, essentially. This allows it to be a little more robust so you can use it in theory, not just for Chandra observations. Uh, as for the cause of the blur, that's just simply due to the um, detector itself. It obviously has some sort of finite resolution that it can achieve and know better. And matching that is important. Okay, I think we have to move on, but there's three more questions in the Q&A. Uh, if, if you can reply them there, Brad, that would be great. Absolutely. And thank you very much. So next we have Pavan Hebar, who is going to talk to us about, uh, from University of Alberta, who's gonna talk about data-driven methods to classify X-ray sources. So there you go, Pavan. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Pawan Hebar, a PhD student at University of Alberta, and I'll be talking about uh, data-driven classification of X-ray sources. Uh, so in the background in this image, you can see that, uh, so it's the recent Erosita release, and you can see thousands of X-ray point source objects in the sky. So uh, though, we have info though we have detected these hundreds of thousands of X-ray sources all across the sky, we have studied if only a few of them, and we don't know what kind of X-ray source it is for most of these X-ray sources. So the current, uh, the current ways of identifying or classifying an X-ray source is either through spectral modeling where we model the X-ray emission and learn the properties of the source, or it's through hardness ratios where we estimate the nature of the X-ray emission and try to classify the source. The problem with these methods is that applying, spect applying spectral modeling to large catalogs, for example, that Chandra source catalogs ha has around 300,000 sources. It could be too tedious for uh, such large catalogs and the hardness ratios are not accurate enough. So what can we do to uh, study uh, these hundreds of thousands of sources more efficiently? Uh, one way is to realize that different kinds of sources have different shapes of X-ray spectra. From this image, we can see that neutron stars and act and AGNs have a continuum dominated spectra with uh, no significant emission lines, except for AGN, which has uh, a dominant Fe K line. Whereas supernova remnants and active uh, normal stars like the sun have, uh, do have line dominated spectra with uh, Lyman FeL lines, Mg, Si, etc. So if you are able to figure out a method by which we can identify these emission line dominated spectra, we can classify the X-ray source more efficiently. So in order to test this, what we, uh, our first step was to test if such a method would work. So we looked at the Q survey for the um, active, for young stars and the CDFS survey for uh, AGN. And using the properties of the stars and AGN in, the, in these surveys, we generated 100,000 fake spec, uh, simulated spectra and then uh, trained our neural network scheme and then compared our result, results with uh, real data if we can classify them as stars or AGN. So how do the, so the typical AGN and active star spectra look somewhat like this in that the 
active star spectra are softer and they have these dominant uh, emission lines. So uh, after training a neural network, neural network method, we were able to get a net accuracy of around 90%. So in, in these figures, I show how the classification error changes with the total counts. And we see that our method works well for like sources above 400 counts. And also you can see that the shape of the curves in our test set and the observations, which is the, uh, which are randomly selected from the KU and the CDFS surveys are pretty close. Meaning that our method seems to work well with the real data too. We have a minute and a half, Pavan. Yeah. Uh, so how do the properties of the stars affect, properties of the stars affect the classification? So uh, we see that uh, for very high NH, we are not able to identify the stars properly because the high NH of 23 or 24 um, obscure the X-ray emission below 2 keV and we won't be able to identify the emission lines. And also for very high KT, the emission lines are not significant and therefore the error in classification is very high. So in conclusion, uh, we showed that we need a more efficient method for which can be applied to large X-ray catalogs to classify X-ray sources and ML seems to, ML seems that it could be a possible way to, possible way and more efficient to study and classify sources. Yeah, so in future, we would like to apply this algorithm to other detector and also try to accommodate for the changing, uh, the changing response of Chandra. So yeah, thank you. And I will leave the conclusion slide. Yeah. Thank you, Pavan. I think we have time for one question. I see Jerv Scarchville saying, I imagine, it's a question, the low count context. I don't know if you want to expand on that or what exactly. Yeah, so uh, so I looked at the, so for our algorithm, I mainly looked at sources above 100 counts. So, but we do observe that uh, at 100 counts, our uh, classification is not really accurate enough. Uh, we need to see if we can train more data uh, in this regime so that we can we can even accommodate for that. But uh, for like sources around 400 counts, at least in the real data, we seem to work well. Okay, thank you, Pavan. And uh, we have to, okay, you have another question uh, from Rafael Martinez Galarza. You can answer it on the Q&A. Um, we have to move on to the next talk. Um, okay, so next we have Bria Hassan from Maulana Assad National Urdu University, Hyderabad in India. And she's going to talk about an X-ray IR and radio view of NGC 281. So I'll leave you with Bria. Priya, I think you are muted. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I hope I'm, I'm, you can hear me right now. Yeah. Yes. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Hi. So thanks, Cecilia. Hi, I'm Priya. And this is work that I'd done when I was visiting the CFA in 2015 with Scott Walk and Moritz. And uh, it's basically work on NGC 281. Um, now, NGC 281 is a, is a star forming complex, which is, a, uh, which is quite close by. It's just 20 k, 2 k, kpc, and it's about 300 parsecs above the galactic plane. And hence, it gives us a very good view of the star formation in it. It's essentially it is separated into two, two, you know, this is a region where you actually have uh, triggered star formation taking place at two different scales. There's a large scale at 300 parsecs. And uh, um, the sequential and ongoing triggered star formation taking place in an adjoining giant molecular cloud. You can see this 281 west. That's a very uh, a young cluster over here. And there is the H2 region, the 281 uh, NGC 281 nebula, and uh, <clears throat> which is often called the Pac-Man nebula also. And um, that's what we are working on. So what you can see over here, here in purple are the Chandra observations, and what you can see in the background, these are the Spitzer observations where you can see these regions. And uh, 
So what we are basically doing is we are studying the young stellar population in this region and uh, looking for the different um, classes of young stellar objects. So uh, the data we've actually used is Chandra ACS data, which is a 100 kilosecond data set. And uh, <clears throat> we actually generated a master X-ray catalog, which has 446 sources. And this is the distribution of them. Uh, <clears throat> Now, if you can look over here, the, the bigger uh, footprint you can see here, this is the warm spitzer image, which you have over here. Here is the ACS footprint. And in the center, what you can see, this is the spitzer cryo data that we have for this very region. And uh, <clears throat> we basically have, a, so uh, this, the, the, the catalog, the spitzer one has 2,475 sources, matches with about 196 X-ray sources. And then we've classified those sources. So, <clears throat> what we actually did is we used the Gotelmont method to actually classify the sources using their um, infrared um, uh, photometry and uh, using that we classified the sources. I won't go into the details because we don't have the time, but essentially we use these sources to classify them into the class one, class two and uh, other sources and uh, <clears throat> using the, the IRAC counts. Now, we also use the MIPS data to classify our sources. So we finally have our data, which is this thing. We also did spectral fitting to get the NH AK by AK values for, um, we did it for, for only 25 sources we could do it for, which had uh, total counts greater than 50 for which we can do it. And we fitted to get the NH and the AK by AK values. And uh, <clears throat> So if you actually see 281 comprises essentially of two clusters, there's a north one and a south one, which was also identified by these authors, Megeth and Sharma also. And uh, <clears throat> here's our distribution. This is the distribution of the sources that we have over here. So you can see the class ones are in red, the class twos are in green, class threes are in blue, and the flat spectrum ones are in magenta. So this shows us the distribution of the sources for the uh, region. And uh, <clears throat> Again, the two subclusters have been also identified using IRAM, BLA IRAM data. Uh, now, essentially, this region also has a lot of diffuse emission, where so you can actually separate it into three regions. The region one, which is the young cluster IC 1590, the region two, which is 281 west, and the region three, which is 281 east. And you have an ionizing source, which is the which is HD 5005. And uh, that's basically creating this thing and uh, it was basically to study this diffuse emission that we actually plan data with the uh, GMRT, which is a radio telescope in India. This is the upgraded GMRT. And the idea was that uh, we, we actually could see the extended emission, which was visible in the NDSS images also in radio. So we proposed deep low frequency observations using the GMRT. And here's the data which we have for this, for this uh, region. We have half a minute left. Yeah. So in conclusions, we can identify the different regions of this thing. And uh, this work was published. You can have a look at it over here. Uh, and thanks. I'll end with this. So I'd, um, oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. So I'll just end with this. And uh, thank you. I'd uh, again like to extend my thanks to Scott Balk and Moritz who'd helped me do this work during my visit in CFA. Thanks a lot. All right. Okay, thank you, Priya. Uh, I think we will have to move on to the next uh, talk, but please, if you have any questions, type them in the Q&A or, or the Slack channel for Priya. Okay, so next, um, we have our uh, invited speaker, who's uh, Tyler Holland Ashford. Tyler has finished his PhD in um in ohio university and is moving now to to cfa as a postdoc uh very soon um so and he's going to talk today about characterizing supernova remnants using x-ray emission so i'll leave you with uh tyler hi yes thanks for that introduction and the invitation to give the talk here uh, so yeah, I'll be talking about studying supernova remnants using X-ray emission, as you mentioned. And with that, I'll just jump in. Uh, main reason why I like to study supernova remnants is to use them to better understand supernova explosions, which are, of course, the explosions of stars at the end of their lifetime. And these events are incredibly bright, incredibly energetic. 
Uh, so here, uh, this um, this this image is showing you a you know supernova down here, this bright dot in comparison to the entire galaxy. They can be as bright as entire galaxies, and they're incredibly important for many facets of astronomy as they you know impart energy into their surroundings through these highly energetic explosions, uh, regulating future star formation, potentially even galactic winds. They synthesize many if all of the heavy elements that. Uh, you know, we see in uh, later generations of stars or on Earth, right, everything heavier than really helium uh, comes from these these highly energetic uh, events. But a problem about uh, learning about them is that they're pretty rare. With a rate of about two per galaxy per century, uh, we have to look far away in order to observe many of them. We haven't seen one in our own galaxy in the Milky Way for the past few hundred years. And so this limits our ability to understand them, especially you know, their explosion mechanisms and progenitor scenarios. And so a way to get around this is to study supernova remnants. Uh, so supernova remnants are the, the leftovers of supernova explosions as they expand through the surrounding medium, uh, plowing into the surrounding interstellar material or circumstellar material from progenitor winds, sweeping it up, heating it, and also heating its own, the supernova's own ejecta. And because these are visible for tens of thousands of years, uh, even though we haven't seen one in the Milky Way, a supernova in the Milky Way for the past few hundred years, we can still see hundreds of these remnants and they are incredibly bright. Uh, as I mentioned, they plow into the surrounding material, heating it up and also heating up their own ejecta to millions of degrees Kelvin, uh, prime X-ray emitting temperatures. And so here is just uh, on the right is a picture of Cassiopeia A supernova remnant, uh, one of the younger ones in the Milky Way, and a cartoon diagram just to help you understand what a supernova is. You have the forward blast wave plowing into the surrounding medium, creating a forward shock, as shown by this blue emission here. And then you also have a reverse shock plowing back inward and heating up the ejecta from the explosion itself. And Chandra is an incredibly valuable telescope for studying these objects as uh, a lot of the young remnants in the Milky Way fit pretty well on Chandra chips. Here are just a sample of a few different supernova remnants. Uh, G292, RCW103, and Cassiopeia A are all fairly young, meaning that most of their emission is coming from ejecta as opposed to swept up material. And they you can see fit on either the four uh, ACES chips or just a single ACES chips uh, being a few arc minutes in extent. And we can also even uh, spatially resolve LMC and SMC supernova remnants. Here on the bottom is an example of that. And importantly, we can observe them, but also see the inner structure of these remnants and uh, identify uh, different structural components to different physics and different plasma states, which helps us understand these objects. And so here I want to show you that is the, the, the spatial understanding of remnants being able to use Chandra. Uh, but of course, in addition to Chandra's high spatial resolution, you also get spectral resolution, uh, moderately good spectral resolution to uh, study these objects in more detail. So here is Kepler's supernova remnant, a type 1a supernova remnant, and uh, just showing you an example of the type of spectra we see when observing these objects is you have broad emission from either thermal bremsschlung from heated up uh, material uh, or synchrotron, non-thermal synchrotron from either the forward shock or a pulsar wind nebula from a central pulsar, a central compact object. And then overlaid on top of those broad emissions is you can actually observe and measure emission lines from different elements. Uh, these are the most common ones, most easily identifiable, oxygen, neon, uh, two sets of iron lines, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, argon, and calcium. And by measuring the strength of these emission lines of these peaks, you can get a handle on how much material is synthesized by the explosion and thus use that to provide constraints on explosion physics and progenitor scenarios. And so just to uh, provide a brief example of the way we do these is by, of course, fitting the spectra with AtomDB models. AtomDB being the uh, atomic data for astrophysicists contains 
a plethora of information on emissivities of different ions at different temperatures. And basically you choose different components uh, shown an example here is you have an absorption component from the intervening hydrogen between us and the remnant. And then you also, uh, in this example, have a one component representing shocked plasma with solar abundances, representing swept up ISM or CSM. And then you also have another component uh, representing the, the ejecta from the explosion itself with variable abundances, uh, notably enhanced relative to solar, where solar would be one here. And you can see like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen have abundance of three relative to solar. Magnesium, silicon, and sulfur have abundances of one and two and you know 2.2. And it's it's this this benefit of Chandra uh, and just X-ray spectra that enables you to disentangle different types of plasmas and place better constraints on them by separating them into their inherent components. And so one thing I want to mention about supernova remnants is that uh, they are asymmetric objects. They uh, both large scale and small scale. Some of them are very circular in their outer exteriors, where some of them are more elliptical. And then that's even, you also have to care about these smaller scales, right? In each of these remnants, each of these colors corresponds to a different emission process and sometimes different elements, actually. And so in each of these remnants, they exhibit their own levels of small scale asymmetries, with Cassiopeia having these broad plumes of ejecta, Tycho being very clumpy. And so it's very important to understand, model, and study these asymmetries in these remnants, as opposed to just fitting this spectra all with one plasma model and saying it's all homogenous. And this is, of course, where Chandra comes in with its spatial resolution. You're able to study individual parts of remnants. And so this was all the background for you know, how we can study supernova remnants and maybe why we study remnants. And so for the rest of the talk, I'll be talking about just a few of the ways that this has been done, um, a few of the new methods that I've encountered uh, in, in studying supernova remnants. Uh, apologies if you I don't mention your particular work. There is a whole bunch of work on supernova remnants, and I, of course, can't get to it all in the time allotted. And I'll also briefly be talking about some work I've specifically done. And so for measuring smaller scales of supernova remnants, there's, of course, the, the uh, here are just two ways of doing this. You can split these remnants up into large regions. Here on the left here is a study done on the supernova remnant Kess 73, where you can extract the spectra of each of these regions. Uh, the Kumar et al. in 2014 did this, and each of these regions would reflect different plasma states and different components. For example, the outer uh, regions here would represent more swept up material and would tell you more about the composition of the ISM or CSM and how the shock front interacts and heats up that material, whereas the more inner regions would re reflect more reverse shock heated ejecta as you have the reverse shock plowing back inward to and heating the ejecta and measuring these would give you uh, properties of reverse shock heating and the elements produced by the explosion. And of course, you can go even more in detail with that with Chandra and get even smaller regions measuring single clumps instead of broad emission. And so this for, was done for Kepler's supernova remnant by Sato and Hughes 2017, and of course by many others. I just chose this one because it had a nice picture, frankly. And so by looking at each of these individual knots, you can extract the spectra of each of these knots. Here's just a sample of spectra and assign them and measure uh, what is the type of emission coming from these. Like for example, the CSM knots in green uh, have much less of these heavy elements. All the emission lines from silicon and sulfur are much lower and you have much more emission from these lighter elements because it is reflective of, of CSM ejecto, which doesn't have these heavy elements produced in explosion. Whereas the other knots have higher of these heavy mass, uh, heavier element abundances and thus can be directly linked with ejecta. And so by doing this all across the remnant, you can get a picture of the general structure and the general products of the uh, explosion itself. But not only can you get uh, spectral properties of these remnants, 
uh, with Chandra by examining specific knots and looking at their red and blue ships and also just their motions in, a, in the plane of the sky as you observe it over a baseline of 5, 10, 20 years, uh, you can get their velocities, uh, their 3D velocities combining their uh, redshift and their plane of sky velocity to then create a map and build a picture of the full 3D nature of remnants because it is important to study remnants in the 3D so that we compare them to 3D models. Of course, the difference, it's important to compare them to 3D models uh, for the most accuracy. There are a lot of differences and uh, problems with, with 1D and 2D models, right? Some explosions are more likely to occur or less likely to occur in 1D and 2D versus 3D. And the uh, code for and the physics of mixing and instabilities is also different between these dimensions. So it's important to be able to compare our best models, our 3D models with our best pictures of remnants, the 3D pictures. And so on the right here, uh, showing you just another cool thing you can do by uh, measuring the uh, velocities of knots over time as they expand outward is you can back evolve them all to a central explosion site. So here is showing knots back evolve to a common center. Um, and it's important to have this type of measurement of supernova remnant explosion centers, because as I mentioned, these, from, these objects are asymmetric, so you can't just assume that the visual center is the true center, uh, or else you're asserting a level of asymmetry that might not be true in reality. And so another thing that's been done, uh, just to highlight a uh, cool method that I encountered in the past few years uh, in analyzing supernova remnant structure, is was uh, trying to understand the origin of clumpiness in Tycho's supernova remnant. Right, you in supernova remnants, you have them expanding into a surrounding medium. And so any asymmetries could come from one of a number of origins. It could come from instabilities or asymmetries during explosion, during like the asymmetric, there could be asymmetric explosion forces or inherent asymmetry to the progenitor star. Uh, there could be instabilities that generate during expansion. As, uh, as the remnant is expanding, or it can be expanding into him in homogeneous ISM, in homogeneous uh, interstellar material or circumstellar material, which could generate some asymmetries. And it's important to understand which, so that we can understand what comes from the explosion and what comes from in the interaction with the environment to help us understand more about explosion physics. And so Sato et al. in 2019 used this genus statistic, which is essentially uh, measuring the the holiness, the amount of holes and the pattern of holes in a, a 2D image, measuring the number of holes uh, above a certain intensity minus the number of holes below a certain intensity. And by varying the intensities and measuring the genus statistic at all of these parameters, you can get a measure of how hold and how clumpy a 2D object is. And so for doing this to Tycho, they compared it to simulations of a uh, where, where the initial ejecta in the explosion was asymmetric or whether it was symmetric and asymmetries only developed later as it was expanding. So testing inherent explosion asymmetries versus not, uh, later asymmetries. And as shown by this left figure here, uh, the left is the initial smooth uh, explosion. The right is where you had a clumpy uh, explosion and then compared to what we actually observe in Tycho's supernova remnant. Uh, by comparing on the right these plots, the smooth model in red to what we actually observe for the genus statistic in Tycho, compared to the clumpy model compared to what we actually observe, it is very clear that this clumpiness from Tycho has to be from initially clumpy ejecta, inherent asymmetric explosion mechanism and thus these asymmetric explosion mechanisms must be used in any you know, 3D simulations of supernova if we want to accurately uh, understand them. And continuing on with asymmetries, uh, my PhD advisor, Laura Lopez in 2011, uh, did a similar type of analysis measuring the asymmetries in supernova remnants, measuring a sample of remnants measuring their multipole moments, uh, similar to the dipole is the first order term and then higher order terms representing smaller and smaller levels of asymmetry. So P2 here is how elliptical 
a source is. P3 is how near asymmetric a source is. And by measuring these in a sample of remnants, was able to find a incredibly striking result that core collapse remnants in blue are systematically more asymmetric than type 1a remnants, implying that there is some common process to all of these core collapse remnants that generate these higher levels of asymmetry, just again emphasizing the importance of understanding the origin of these uh, of asymmetry in supernova remnants. And so I've talked a bit about measuring all the structure across remnants and measuring uh, the ejecta properties of small clumps, individual limited number of clumps. But you can even go more detail with Chandra and do a spatially resolved grid analysis, uh, splitting the remnant into you know, as many regions as really possible down to Chandra's pixel size um, of you know, less than an arc second, although more realistically limited by the amount of signal you have. But you have enough signal, you can split it into hundreds or even thousands of regions, fit the spectra of each region and get map of the entire remnant. And then you get the, all the properties that you might care about, temperature, ejecta abundances, ionization state, velocities, all across the entire remnant to build a full picture of these extended objects. And so a big study I want to mention is uh, Huang and Lamming in 2012 studied the supernova remnant Cassiopeia A, did this type of grid-based spectroscopy. Uh, here just showing you their temperature map uh, for all just mainly to show you just all the regions that they chose. Each of these boxes is an individual region they extracted spectro to. And on the middle here is their final map of the presence and intensity of silicon emission. And by creating these types of maps for all the elements, they were able to uh, get acquire estimates of total masses of each of these ejecta elements, oxygen through iron, which are greatly help in constraining simulations and explosion mechanisms, because now we have an observation to compare the predictions of nucleosynthesis to. And so I'm going to uh, move on slightly into some projects that I've done on measuring supernova remnant asymmetries, uh, mainly expanding on the work of my PhD advisor, Dr. Laura Lopez, again measuring these asymmetries measured by multipole moments, dipole, quadrupole, octopole, uh, measuring bulk emission, uh, bulk direction of ejecta, ellipticity, and mirror asymmetry, respectively. So one project I want to do is build on hers and study the uh, relationship between bulk ejecta asymmetries in supernova remnants and neutron star kick velocities. Because uh, neutron stars, the compact objects left over from some core collapse supernova, are, have been observed to be kicked to hundreds of kilometers per second, maybe even up to a thousand. Here is the distribution of observed neutron star speeds. And these velocities are too high to come from any disruption of a binary. And so they must come from some supernova process. And the dominating theory has been a conservation of momentum-like process with asymmetric ejecta uh, examined uh, in, in these papers and more. And these papers have successfully, in 3D simulations, generated neutron star kicks through this process, through the process where asymmetric explosion mechanisms cause the bulk of ejecta uh, here in green to move in one direction and the neutron star to be kicked in the opposite direction. But of course, these were all simulations. And so the question was, do we see this actually in, in uh, reality? And so my project was to test that. And uh, briefly, I just want to mention that Chandra is also enables us to very well measure the proper motions of neutron stars across the sky, just over a 10 or 15 year baseline. Uh, it's just shown here is the measurement of the proper motion of a neutron star in Puppis A. And as you can see with a five year baseline using Chandra uh, high resolution camera, there's still a pretty large error, 400 kilometers per second. But once they got to the 10 or 20 years baselines, you're able, easily able to measure the motion of neutron stars across the sky with uh, fairly high precision, enabling you to get uh, robust neutron star velocities. And so this is important, especially in upcoming years, whereas in the next five years of Chandra observations, pretty much all remnants will have a 15 or 20 year baseline to which measure uh, more precise neutron star motions. And so my project was to compare neutron star velocities to bulk ejecta direction in supernova remnants. And doing so, I got a uh, pretty striking result. Uh, I'm not sure if 
this I'm not sure how to get rid of the top thing on my screen, not showing it showing for you. Uh, but if if there is something blocking the top of the screen, this plot shows that uh, the difference between the bulk ejecta motion and the neutron star angle. And for the most of the remnants I investigate in my sample, the neutron star was found to be moving almost directly opposite the ejecta motion and consistent with these theories, consistent with the asymmetric explosion processes used to generate neutron star kicks. Uh, and this, my project was actually uh, a year later, Katsura et al. put out a very similar work using slightly different methodology that got consistent results, finding again that neutron stars going up in this plot are kicked opposite the bulk of ejecta in these supernova remnants, again consistent with these simulations, continue with these asymmetric explosion mechanisms. But there are, uh, of course, uh, more detailed predictions that can be made from these asymmetric explosion mechanisms. Specifically, uh, that the heaviest elements, elements that are formed predominantly during explosion, as opposed to much, much uh, earlier uh, prior to explosion and exist in shells out toward the exterior of the progenitor, these elements should be uh, more strongly subject to asymmetric explosion forces and thus should be kicked in a direction most opposite Sorry, so these elements should exhibit higher levels of asymmetry than lighter elements. And similarly, the neutron star should be kicked most opposite to these heaviest elements as they are all formed in the uh, interior of the explosion closest to these asymmetric explosion forces. And so I created elements of maps of different elements in a supernova remnant Cassiopeia A with the goal of comparing different elements asymmetries to each other and to the neutron star kick direction. And so here I'm just showing you different maps uh, created via spatially resolved grid analysis of Cassiopeia A fitting the spectra and extracting the amount of emission from each element. And just visually you can see there are differences between each of these. Iron is resolved into these three plume structure, which we know to be true in Cassiopeia A, whereas other elements are more broadly diffused. And uh, this is and, and, and sometimes in different directions. And so for quantifying my results, I again use the multipole moments measuring level of asymmetry. Don't really need to care about their, their exact details, but this plot is again showing the, the levels of elliptical and mirror asymmetry. Things at the top right are more asymmetric, things on the bottom are less asymmetric, more symmetric. And I found a pretty striking result again, that as predicted, the heavier elements, iron, for example, were more asymmetric than lighter elements, for example, oxygen. And they even seem to be naturally glooped by burning process, whereas things formed much prior to explosion are very symmetric. Things formed entirely during explosion, iron, are very asymmetric. And things formed partly during and partly prior to explosion have moderate levels. Tyler, you have two more minutes. Gotcha. And then finally, another uh, conclusion of this study was again to compare the neutron star kick velocity to the element directions, where the theory is that the neutron star should be kicked most opposite the heaviest elements. And I did find exactly that. Here's a zoomed in region of Cassiopeia A, where the neutron star is moving downward from the explosion site, and most opposite to it is these heavier elements, this iron, argon, calcium, titanium, as opposed to the lighter mass elements of oxygen. So just again, further proof of these importance of using asymmetric explosion mechanisms in supernova remnants. And so finally, I want to mention a very promising method uh, for, for analyzing uh, supernova remnants in detail. Remember, I talked to you about this spatially resolved grid-based spectral analysis where you split the remnant into hundreds or thousands of regions and extract the spectra of each region individually to get a whole map. Uh, this process is very cumbersome and you also lose a lot of the detail from the image because you're splitting it into very small lower signal regions. And so I want to emphasize this promising new method of doing this, the general morphological, generalized morphological component analysis uh, made by, developed by Adrian Picrino and Fabio Serro. Uh, it effectively simultaneously fits all the pixels in the supernova remnant, extracting common spectral features. Uh, so I don't have much time left, but I just want to show you the strengths of doing this. It's been applied to supernova remnants in the recent years, and you should very much attend this talk of uh, blind source separation techniques for X-ray spectra imagers on August 25th, 10 a.m. if you want to hear more about this cool method for analyzing the entire spectra across the entire remnants all at once. And with that, uh, thank you for your time.
Thank you so much, Tyler, for a great talk. Um, okay, we have a question uh, from Solon Bauman. Uh, why are the neutron stars moving in the opposite direction of the heavy elements physically? Physical reason, perhaps model. Uh, yes, so that is a great question. Uh, let me see. So yeah, these uh, simulators were investigating the interactions between ejecta and uh, neutron star kick. And they found in their simulations that the neutron star is most gravitationally accelerated to the slowest moving ejecta, the ejecta that has the least energy input and thus remains closer to the neutron star for the longest period of time. So in this diagram, you have a lot of ejecta that moves away from it in the downward direction very quickly. And you also have some ejecta that is emitted in the opposite, in upward in this diagram very slowly. And then the neutron star is gravitationally accelerated preferentially in that direction. Uh, So-called their gravitational tugboat mechanism where you have slow moving ejecta pulling and accelerating the neutron star toward it. Okay. Um, I think there's no more questions right now. So I'll ask you, I have a question. Uh, yeah. so, from the method you explained you have used already, you did find three things that are consistent with the uh, predictions by this theory. Yes. Um, I was wondering first if there are other, other correlations that could uh, give you further confirmation of this, if there are other predictions that you could check to see if, if, um, if are matched by this, or that's all the predictions that you could test. And also I didn't, uh, quite understand uh, because you didn't have much time, I think, or maybe it was just me. The the difference with the new method you will use, except the fine gr grid. Uh, what is the new method? Is it that you can self consistently do all at the same time? Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, so I'll answer your second question first. Instead of analyzing each region one by one, fitting the spectra of each, essentially what this GMACA method does is I don't want to talk about it too much because this is their talk and I don't want to step on their toes, but it, it simultaneously yes, fits all of the regions at the same time, extracting common spectral features and then weighting each pixel with how much that component is present in each of those pixels. And so for your other question, which is a very good question uh, asking about other predictions you can test for this, uh, this asymmetric explosion mechanisms causing asymmetric ejecta. Uh, so one project that I'm working on currently is uh, to test whether this is present in other supernova remnants. So for this project, I found that heavier elements are more asymmetric in the single supernova remnant, Cassiopeia A. Uh, but of course, Cassiopeia A is only a single remnant. And it's also kind of weird one. Uh, it's oxygen rich, which is not necessarily the standard type of supernova explosion. And it's also a type 2b, which means it's had a strong uh, pre-supernova wind, which ejected a lot of its material from the uh, progenitor before exploding. So it's not the most common type of supernova, type 2p. So it'd be interesting to see if what I find here is present in many different supernova remnants and uh, both core collapse and also type 1a. Uh, type 1a potentially uh, the level of asymmetry of different elements could be a good test of determining whether it comes from double degenerate, two white dwarfs colliding, or single degenerate origin, where you have a white dwarf and a you know, post-main sequence star. And so that's something I find uh, very interesting and you know, hoping to get a result for there. All right, thank you, Tyler. Um, well, I think it was a lot of information there. So if anybody has more questions later after thinking about it a little bit, just type them in the Q&A or the Slack channel and Tyler, can, you can check that and try to answer those later. And so we will now move on to our next talk by um, J. Michael uh, Burgess from Max Planck. Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about 3ML, the multi-mission maximum likelihood frame. So I will leave the room to him. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Jay Michael um, from MPE. Uh, and I wanna to present to you 3ML, a uh, tool we've been developing over the past five or so years um, to do multi-messenger, um, 
uh, spectral analysis and spatial analysis. Uh, I myself am not an X-ray astronomer. I'm a gamma ray astronomer, but I did my undergraduate research with Brian Ramsey. So things like Chandra are very close to my heart. So um, just, oops, here we go. Yeah, just quickly, uh, 3ML has, is an open source tool. It has a large development team spread out now um, all across the US and uh, Europe. We have several dedicated plugins that have uh, been designed for the analysis framework, and uh, there's a lot of active development going on in GitHub. So please visit and contribute uh, if you find it something interesting to work on. So the first question is, why build a new tool? There are um, a lot of excellent spectral analysis tools that are in existence for doing um, X-ray spectral analysis. But uh, this is kind of the picture right now for uh, multi-instrument broadband analysis. You have a bunch of um, data points that have been deconvolved from various different instruments with very different um, likelihoods. And we like to plot them on a new, a new plot like this, uh, run an SED fitter tool that kind of uses some least squares um, or MCMC mechanism to put some lines through this data. But that's kind of where we're stuck at. And there's a bit of a problem is that all these data points, they come from different instruments and all of these different instruments have very different uh, responses, likelihoods, mechanisms and complex data reduction uh, tools that get to these deconvolved data points, which aren't really data points, they're model points. In fact, there's a, what's kind of started the work in 3ML was there's a very particular instrument uh, the Fermi gamma ray satellite, which has two instruments on there. One of them is TPM, which is kind of like a fancy Geiger counter. And the other one is the lab, which is basically a particle detector in space. No, it detects gamma rays, not particles. Um, these two tools, uh, I worked on GBM in uh, graduate school. They had their own set of data analysis tools, ARMFIT, which was uh, basically a forward folding gamma ray software that uh, was used to analyze GBM. And then there were the lat science tools, which are heavily based on root and did a whole bunch of complex data reduction and fitting of diffuse and point um, and extended sources all at the same time. But you can imagine it was very difficult if you wanted to fit the data from these two instruments on the same satellite together. You would have to deconvolve the data in one of the tools and then pass it to the other tool and uh, losing all the sensitivity of the instrument or vice versa. And so, uh, that's when myself and some people from the LAT got together and decided we need to make a tool that allows us to exploit the sensitivity of both instruments fitting the data in their raw form at the same time. Um, because these are not data, these are deep involved model points. And thus 3ML was born. So the idea was we wrap the instrument dependent software in, um, these, uh, in a Python framework and we wrap the tools in a plugin. And a plugin is essentially an interface between data and a model um, that produces the likelihood of the instrument. And this is where instruments with different data and different responses can actually talk together. And these plugins will run all the instrument dependent software, um, low level interfits that are going on all um, at the same time while communicating through the same model. And so to give you kind of an idea of what it's like, we have, um, at the lower energies, we have plugins for doing um, spectrophotometry at X-rays. We have um, what we call OGIP-like, which I'll talk about more in a minute, which is for X-ray data. We have a plugin for Fermi, we have a plugin for Hawk, and we're working on plugins for the uh, IACT instruments in the future. And the idea is you wrap each of the instrument dependent software in these plugins and you pass them all into this thing that's called a data list. And this was in the end going to allow the instruments to talk together through their likelihoods. So since this is about x-rays, I want to talk about this plugin called OGIP Lite, which is basically it's um, a plugin that reads um, the standard PHA2, um, RMF, ARF FITS files, um, and its likelihood uh, is based off of just doing forward folding through the response matrix. The plugin will read the header information out of the FITS files and choose the correct likelihood for you. So you, you don't get an option of going, I want to use chi-square on my low count x-ray data. It's kind of hard coded without you hacking it um, into the plugin. You can do all the kinds of things that you would expect to do, like rebinning. Um, you have access to the low level information that's in the data files. You can do sensitivity calculations, plotting. You can simulate models from um, or simulate new data from models. And it's also an interface between various different types of data files so that you can write everything back out to PHA files at the end. Okay, so. 
that's one part of 3 ml, which is the, the plugins. But of course, if you want to form a likelihood from your data, you need a model. So we wrote a sister package of this called Astro Models, which is this hierarchical Python-based um, modeling software, which can be used independently of 3ML. And the idea is you have a giant model that forms some kind of a tree structure where you have different types of point sources, extended sources, neutrino sources, and they can all have different properties, which can all be free parameters in the model. Um, you can easily create models on the fly, like a Jupyter notebook. You can interface to other languages because it's Python. Um, and we now have, uh, you can import most of the XPEG models um, in a very similar way that you do to Sherpa. Uh, you can build template models or table models from simulations. Um, and one of the really nice things is that Astro models, it's the models are all serializable. So you can save, if you build a very complex model, you can save it to disk as a YAML file. And this also allows you to serialize the model um, to be used on HPC systems. So if you want to run um, really expensive uh, multi-source fits uh, on an HPC, you don't have any problems with uh, trying to pickle or serialize the model. Uh, yeah. So, to give you an idea of the model structure, um, what a model, uh, the likelihood model is basically a composition of a bunch of different types of sources. You can have point sources, extended sources, particle sources, neutrino sources, and they can have different properties, which can all be free parameters. There's um, position, spectrum, polarization, um, et cetera. So it allows you, oops, it allows you, well, of course. The animation. Um, it allows you to ask questions like, is my the cosmic ray spectrum connected to the neutrino spectrum? Um, can I, I can fit a point source on top of an extended source and vary all the model parameters at the same time. Um, and since you're doing this in all these different instruments, they can be attached to different sources and allows you to fully get a lot of information out of your data and your model um, and exploit the complete sensitivity of your instruments. Um, so Okay, now we have a likelihood and data and a model. Um, we want to be able to explore this parameter space in, in whatever way we want to and um, estimate parameters. So you take this model object and this data list object that you've constructed from all your sources and all your different plugins, and you can just choose to pop them either in a Bayesian analysis um, framework, which is just another object, or a joint likelihood. Everything is pretty much the same, except for that you would want to um, set priors on your parameters if you go for Bayesian analysis. But you don't really have to do a lot of reconfiguring to jump between the two different types of analyses. In a similar way that we have plugins to different instruments, we also have plugins to, um, we, we treat all the different optimization and sampler algorithms like, um, plugins as well. So we have interfaces to a whole lot of optimization algorithms. Uh, it, we, it comes preloaded with Minuet. Um, and the same with samplers, you can use EMC, Multinest, Ultranet, Zeus, Dynasty. And we continue to add them uh, new algorithms on as they come, up, come in. But it's very easy to just jump between all the different algorithms, um, depending on what you want to do. If you want to test robustness of an algorithm or you want to do something really fast with maximum likelihood, it's very simple to switch out in your analysis in real time. So that's pretty much the 3ML framework. It's a, you can think of it as an abstract toolkit for building analysis from different instruments with very complex hierarchical models and then being able to fit them um, with a variety of different tools. And just to kind of, um, again, hammer in why we, we went for this is that a lot of the past tools for, um, uh, Fermi or X-rays um, or polarization, uh, they focused on basically you have to hammer your, your data into a specific file format to go into an analysis package, which ended up you can lose sensitivity for certain types of instruments if it's not appropriate for that data type. And we kind of switched this around is that the analysis package is agnostic to whatever form the data comes in that's specified in the plugin. So you can inherit the base plugin and create an X-ray tool that um, is based off root data or based off of HDF5, whatever your preferred um, analysis package or preferred data format is that allows you to um, best express the richness of your data. Just to give a couple of examples of some of the plugins that um, we've developed and some of the science that's allowed, um, one of the most interesting ones that I worked on a few years ago was with Polar, which is a gamma ray polarimeter designed to look at the polarization of gamma ray burst. 
So they originally were trying to find they, all their data is in root and they wanted to convert their data to FITS files, but it was a little bit too complex to be able to fit into some other tools. So they came to me and we built a plugin that was based around their root and HDF5 data. Um, and we were able to build a complex um, simultaneous polarization and spectral likelihood because their um, polarization likelihood depended on the shape of the spectrum. So you needed to fit both of these at the same time. In addition to that, they didn't have great spectral res resolution, so they wanted to use data from GRBs that were also observed with GBM, and they wanted to use the spectral information from that. And so we were able to build a complex polarization spectral likelihood for polar and then fit the, all that together simultaneously with GBM down in the native Poisson data space. Um, so that's one of the things that was, uh, was a really neat example of what you could do with this kind of framework. Um, and another thing, a graduate student um, here at MPE is completely redoing the integral SPI analysis because um, right now they kind of do a deconvolution um, first and then refit the data. And he wanted to see if he could forward fold through the coded aperture of SPI um, to better connect the um, energy space to allow you to get more sensitivity for doing gamma ray lines and also studying gamma ray bursts. So he's written now a native plugin for um, SPI that uh, currently does transient objects, but um, he's also um, developing one for, for point sources and um, extended sources uh, to, to extend this framework. So, and this is all in pure Python and it's much faster um, than the original uh, integral SPI software. Um, and just some other examples of really neat joint analysis between instruments that weren't possible before. This is a paper done um, where they looked at some objects that were observed by Fermi Lat and um, Hawk. And both of these have native plugins in 3ML and you were able to do a joint spectral and spatial analysis with um, the with 3ML, um, but down again in the native data space, which uh, allowed to bring up the sensitivity of both instruments. Um, Hawk is using 3ML quite a lot because they ended up ditching their old um, C++ framework to, for a, a framework that was based completely on 3ML, which is um, a lot faster. And so they, they've been making a lot of discoveries using 3ML over the past few years. And um, the, the kind of the next thing now is to hopefully integrate 3ML into the ICT generic framework, Gamma Pi, which is going to be used for CTA. And then we'll have a plugin so that you can do all this high energy uh, analysis all in one place, but again, exploiting the native sensitivity of the instruments. Um, and just because it's serializable, it's very modular, we can use 3ML as a toolbox to simulate data, fit data, and do plugins that are living all across clusters. So this is a pipeline that we developed to do um, gamma ray burst localization. It's all built with components from 3ML running um, in real time. Uh, every time there's a gamma ray burst trigger, it goes out and fires off on an um, HPC and does ga gamma reverse localizations. Similarly, we can build these really nice um, catalog fitting tools so you can go through and fit all the spectra from all the GRBs um, in, uh, in a really nice way on a cluster. Um, because of the modularity, treating 3ML not really as a spectral fitting tool, but as, uh, as a toolbox to build um, analyses and models. Um, so, I'll just uh, in there, so there's just plenty of time for questions. Um, just 3ML is a new toolbox um, and uh, there will be a tutorial on September 1st and we can go into the details because it's very difficult to talk about uh, a code without actually getting down and, and seeing if it's even useful or a fun interface for, for anyone. Um, but it is open source, contributions are welcome. We have a pretty vibrant, um, a team that's working on things and we love contributions. We love issues. If something doesn't work, please let us know. We try to fix it as um, quickly. There's lots of documentation, um, much more than I can go into here. So please go read it. Sorry for the typos. Um, and in the future right now, um, there's an IceCube plugin that's currently being developed that's going to allow us to do um, spectral fitting between um, and with uh, where the spectra are produced for the uh, neutrinos, as well as the photons. So we'll be able to bring that um, together. There's uh, currently an XP plugin being developed so that you can do uh, X-ray polarization with, uh, with XP uh, when it's there. Uh, we're working on documentation and trying to make things more um, um, configurable so that you can really uh, fine tune your plots and how you like to do your analysis. And um, the, 
everything is very stable right now, but we're about to introduce a new low level Python framework, which is for Astro models, the modeling part, which is a lot faster and will have a lot more um, features so that you can develop much more complex models. So thank you. Thank you, J. Michael. That was a very interesting. Um, uh, let's see if there's any questions. Looks like nothing yet. I have a few. Sure, um, sure. Okay, so first of all, maybe I missed this, but I was wondering, so if I get this right, the user will not be uh, developing any plugins, but <coughs> using the plugins you guys have developed. Um, yes, yeah, so, so you can actually, it's, th there's instructions for this. It's pretty easy to build a plugin. Um, we do this for like toy instruments. Um, like we, we have a little um, thing we're doing with some master students where they run a JOUNT simulation for a small scintillator cube and produce um, different kinds of responses and then make a plugin for it just to, to play around with different instrument concepts. But to make a plugin, basically you just need to define three things, which are um, how, the model gets translated into your instrument and um, the uh, and, and the name of the plugin. And the other thing that you have to do is return the likelihood. So if you just define those two things um, in this generic plugin prototype class, you have a plugin that 3ML understands and um, you don't have to put it actually inside of the 3ML um, software repository, it can live on its own. And that's another thing that's important is that we, we had to do this because of Hawk. Um, 3 is BSD license. So if you don't want to make your plugin open source or any part of it, you don't have to. Um, we had to do that because Hawk's um, low level software was not public at the time. And you'd use Astro model for that? Um, pardon me? You talked about Astro model and and I was wondering if you use AstroModel to, to build plugins or you just use AstroModel with the existing plugins. Yeah, so AstroModel just defines the model. So if you, the, the simplest thing is if you just want to do a spectral fit, you define the spectral shape, you define a point source, like you say, this is my point source with this spectral shape, you pass it to the model, and then you pass that model to a 3ML plugin. And then 3ML translates that into the instrument's response and then as you change the parameters of the model, it will, um, the plugin can return a likelihood. Okay. And I'm sorry, I'll stop asking you because I missed that there was a question from Solon Bauman um, saying, so the 3 ml satisfactorily takes care of the cross normalization between different instruments and mission observables, observations, et cetera. How is that done? So um, each plugin can define internal nuisance parameters, which are just um, parameters that um, they're attached to the model, but they are only uh, affect the, the local um, plugin. So for example, in like the OGIP plugin, you can, um, there's a, a calibration constant, which just multiplies the, the response matrix um, by a, a normalization factor. This way you can optimize this normalization factor for an independent plugin um, while you're still optimizing the, the model that goes to all the plugins. Um, some more complex examples are things like the Fermi Lat um, plugin has, there's a lot of low level fitting for um, the templates and diffuse um, emission in the Fermi Lat plugin. And those are internal nuisance parameters which are optimized during the fit, but they only affect things inside of that plugin. Okay. Um... And lastly, I wanted to ask you, um, because uh, I think you mentioned this very briefly, but the catalog, the catalog fitting tool, how, how, would, how does it compare to, to the other, like the fitting a particular, how much more difficult is to do this through a whole catalog what? and what does it involve? I mean, it, it, it really depends on your application. So. Um, I mean, that's like the catalog fitting tool is something that it's something that I developed. Um, it's in a different repository building on the, the tools of 3ML. But yeah, so it, um, there are a lot of data reduction and also catalog um, reading tools in 3ML. So for example, for GBM, um, you can get a list from the HIOSARC catalog of all the GRBs. It returns all the information to actually build a model and a plugin automatically. So um, uh, and then reduce the light curve data into spectra. And so it's basically 
um, to do that, except for the parallelization stuff, it's around 20 lines of code and you can go and fit the entire GBM catalog, download the data, um, reduce it and fit it. But of course that's very specific to that type of instrument. Um, we have catalog interfaces to Swift right now and Fermilat um, and I can't remember anymore off the top of my head, oh, integral to some extent. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it, the catalog stuff is not really built into 3ML. 3ML is more of a toolbox of components that you can use to build something like that. And, and if you go to the documentation, there's lots of examples for how to, how to do these things. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you so much. And mm -hmm. um, keep an eye for questions in the Q&A and, and the Slack, since they seem to come a little bit after the talk sometimes. <laughs> All right, so we'll move on to our last talk this session that is uh, going to be by Oleg Kar Kargaltsev from George Washington University, who's going to talk to us about population of variable sources in galactic plane from, from CSC V2 version. Um, okay, so thank you, Cecilia. I hope you can hear me. Um, yes, all right, please. so I'm going to continue the topic of classifying uh, X-ray sources that has been started here. In particular, I will focus on the population of variable sources from Chandra Source Catalog 2. Um, here are a list of my collaborators from George Washington University and uh, NASA Goddard. Uh, the uh, work is based on the pipeline that we created, supervised learning pipeline, which is called Move, Move Class. Uh, you will hear more about the pipeline from the talk uh, later this afternoon by Hui Yang. Um, and uh, I'm not going to talk about the pipeline itself, except for saying that it relies on the training data set of uh, 3000 sources come from nine different classes. You can see here on the left, uh, and that's the structure of the pipeline, which will be explained later by Hui. Um, the uh, multiple multi wavelengths parameters go in there, fluxes, hardness ratios. But uh, what I will focus today is that there are some variability features, temporal features, basically the how variable is the source in terms of the probability of being variable. Um, the training data set itself can be accessed at this link. It was briefly described by Jeremy Hare um, on August 17. So this is just a, one slide more about the pipeline, which is just basically characterizes the performance of the pipeline. It's called confusion matrix. The more diagonal it is, the better. The numbers on diagonal are the fractions of correctly classified sources. You'll hear more about it from P. But you can notice from here that uh, we are not classifying all classes uh, equally well. Some are well classified, some are not so well, like uh, let's say the uh, low mass X-ray binaries is not um, a large number on diagonal. Um, how do we actually, uh, uh, what else does the pipeline do? It reports the confidence of classification. And again, I cannot go here in the details, uh, but we build the distributions for each of uh, the classes. We build the distribution of probabilities uh, and the closer it is to one, the more likely the source belongs to this class, right? So here is that's the most probable class and these are least uh, uh, less probable. Uh, now back to transients. Uh, so I'm talking about variable sources. We heard that there's a lot of interesting things that can be learned about transients. So one question that I am focusing here on, what types of sources are actually variable and X-rays? Since we have our training data set of 3000 sources, we can actually see by class which ones are more variable. How do we measure actually variability? Well, there's different ways, but one can determine short-term and long-term variabilities. Let's say between observations is going to be long-term within the observation short-term. Uh, one can use different statistics, Kuiper test, chi-square anyway. But here uh, is, uh, you can see that there are a couple classes of sources, young stellar store objects or young stars and uh, low mass X-ray binaries, which are most variable, right? That's shown by this blue and um, green uh, color. So um, we expect those to be most variable. Now, uh, what features are actually used by the pipeline to classify. So this is actually the usage of the features, feature importance. So the X-ray fluxes, hardness ratios are being used. The temporal information on the top here um, is being used. There's some uh, uh, colors and, and other things are being used. Um, the, um, One and a half minutes, Oleg. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we don't use something that we would like to use, like uh, variability time scales or how colored the Fourier power spectrum is or 
uh, if there is any variability outside X-ray band, those will be useful to use, but we don't use them. Now, what we actually classify is a, a variable sources according to channel source catalog from just the galactic plane. And here is the result of classifications for most confident sources. So we find that a lot of uh, young stars are variable, which is not unexpected given by uh, this plot, for instance, from Feigelson 2006, which shows that uh, X-ray activity drops down with the age. And it's consistent also with what we see in our training data set. There are some biases that I cannot discuss here uh, that may actually be that some more low mass stars variable and they mix in into YSOs. There's a more uh, about this uh, maybe from Chen, Stephen Chen on August 26. Overall, we check the consistency uh, using this X class tool, and we think our classifications are quite reasonable. Low mass stars uh, are uh, brighter and optical than uh, YSOs in terms of the ratio. The, um, they're soft, low mass stars uh, softer than YSOs, and so on. Uh, and finally, we check several sources, and they do look like this looks like a flare from the star, consistent by according to Guy with G2 star. Luminosity is reasonable. That's the AGN according to our classification. And indeed, according to the spectrum, looks reasonable. That may be a little bit more questionable. But um, I'm, I'm going to end with a summary here. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Oleg. And I think we are out of time. Um, so if there's any questions, I, I, I encourage you to, to check. Um, there's one question right now in the Q&A. Um, so if you could answer Raphael there. That would I'll be check the Slack, I guess. It's, right? it's in the Q&A, this one. But Raphael, you can type it on the slide, Slack as well, if, if you don't mind. Um, okay, so I would like, with this, we finished the session, and I would like to thank all of our, our speakers again, and we'll be moving on to, to the next session now. I'll leave you with Rudy. Thank you, Cecilia, for being an awesome chair. Uh, thank you all for speaking. I'm going to close this session now, and I will open up the next session um, closer to the hour. Thank you.